thank you for coming. Uh, some people were not here yesterday, right? Can I have an idea who wasn't there yesterday? Okay, so I'll start with a small recap of like some session, session things we said yesterday. And, and, I'll, and I'll remind you when we're about five uh, o'clock. So <laughs> yeah, because that's, uh, I'm, I'm known for. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Nobody was I like to I like to hear myself speak, so that's a, <laughs> not a good thing. Um, okay. Um, so yesterday we talked about the politics of peer-to-peer, -peer, and the, so the main thesis, maybe to to recall, is that uh, because of the accessibility of the networks, we now have uh, a massive possibility for people to connect to each other without permission, permissionless uh, connection, but also to self-organize, right? And so we see more and more communities that attempt and actually also realize ways to create value um, by creating shared commons and then create an economy around these shared commons. Uh, and we saw also how that creates new institutional realities. But the key problem today is that this emergent um, proto mode of production and I say proto mode because a full mode of production would be able to fully self-reduce itself, right? So I think yesterday I gave the example, I do it again today. Uh, at the end of the 18th century, we had the putting out system, which was that the, the machines became more expensive, so they were, the, the guilds were no longer able to invest in these machines, so the early capitalists would buy these machines, provide the raw material to the guilds, then get the product from them, and then they would sell it on the market, right? The, so in this kind of system, these owners of capital were not able to reproduce themselves without uh, using the old system, you know, the, the guild system, which was not a capitalist system, which was a pre-capitalist system, right? But then uh, a few decades later, uh, after the enclosures, after the destruction of the guilds, then uh, people were obliged to uh, be labor and sell their time and body in order to survive. So at that time, labor became a commodity, and then capitalism became a fully organic system, which was able to reproduce itself fully or almost fully within its own rules, right? So uh, peer production today is in a very similar situation, where what we have today is an accumulation of the commons. So more and more people are creating shared resources, are creating in the first stage, mostly immaterial commons, but they are sharing their knowledge, software and design. So we have open knowledge communities, open software communities, and open design communities. Uh, if you combine this with the distribution of the means of production, so we're talking about uh, networked forms of capital, like in machinery, we have 3D printing, so the price of machinery goes down. So it becomes, Im we can start imagine, you know, Reproduce, producing ourselves again and owning the machines that we need uh, to produce. Uh, we have social lending and crowdfunding, which allows us to imagine that we can obtain capital without necessarily going through the centralized financial institutions. We have new forms of money like Bitcoin. I'm very critical about Bitcoin, and I talked about it last time. But still, historically, this is the first globally scalable post Westphalian socially sovereign currency. Right? We, I may not like the characteristics of Bitcoin, but in terms of historical change, it's an important proof of concept, right? So once we have Bitcoin, we can think, well, you know, maybe Bitcoin is dysfunctional, but, you know, for social justice and other things, but maybe we can do something similar that would have, you know, the kind of character, characteristics that we like. So all of these things together uh, create a fairly massive shift towards these new modalities of collaborative commons that that uh, Rifkin uh, talks about. And Rifkin has all his interesting thesis, which I think is correct, uh, when he talks about marginal cost. Well, maybe it's a bit over the top, but nevertheless, I think the, the basic argument is that what is happening today with immaterial commons, you know, which are reproducible at marginal cost, is, not, is starting to happen at least in some areas of physical production, right? He, he talks about renewable energy. So once you invest in renewable energy, then the sun and the wind, they keep blowing, they keep, it keeps shining. You don't need to reinvest all the time in extraction like you would have to do with uh, fossil fuels, right? 
So this kind of re reproducibility uh, that creates commons in the immaterial sphere, his argument is that this is also coming in the material sphere. What he does not do is problematize that transition. It's just kind of like, he's a technocrat, right? So if the technology is there, it will happen. That's basically, I think, the weakness of, of Rifkin. So uh, this is the reality today of peer production in a political economy of capital, right? So we have peer production communities. We have coders, designers, uh, knowledge producers, which are creating these commons. And if you like, the value is deposited in the commons today. Uh, you know, the use value is deposited uh, in the commons. But what about the exchange value, right? Well, here's a problem. If I am a commoner, a peer producer, and I contribute to a common resource, how do I make a living? And the way to make a living is to become labor for capital or a freelancer. Right? I'm still working for the market, and we're still in the sphere of capital accumulation. If we looked at Facebook yesterday, if you remember, where we see that we have a system where a platform would have no value without us, uh, you know, without users, it would have zero value, and yet the exchange value is exclusively captured by these, uh, what I call, metarchical capitalists, right? So what's the difference? In, so there is in France a school of regulation, it's called, and they, they distinguish industrial capitalism and cognitive capitalism, different regimes of accumulation, right? Now in cognitive capitalism, which is basically what we are in today, and this is an emergent new form, in cognitive capitalism what's happening is that the money uh, is no longer realized mostly in production, right? The Chinese capitalists, they have very low profit rates. They have like 3% profit rates. 70% uh, of the profit that is made through this production of, let's say, Apple, 70% is captured by Apple, right? It's not captured by the Chinese, it's captured by Apple. And it's because they have IP, and it's because they have control over the networks, right? They control the supply chain. They, comp they control the knowledge, right? So this is what cognitive capitalism is about. It's regime of value where you, you can realize the value not if you're directly in production, but if you are in the meta level of, of, of knowledge that you need to do that production. Uh, but in cognitive capitalism, what you need is, you need IP, right? It's, uh, so you can ask 3,000% more because you have a legal, legally protected artificial scarcity. Nobody else can copy and reproduce that protected uh, knowledge. Um, but I think if you see at Facebook and Google, IP is a very marginal element of their strategy. It's not what it's about, right? So this is different. Metargal capitalism is a direct exploitation of human labor, of human cooperation. So it is different, right? So it's what Facebook is doing, it, it's not producing anything, basically. Google is not producing documents. YouTube is not producing videos. Flickr is not producing photographs. What they are doing is they are enabling and empowering us to create that use value directly, but then they capture uh, the scarcity of it, which is our attention, right? So this is their business model. So we have, uh, in my view, we have this shift towards a new form of capital, which is directly connected to peer production, right? And they capture the value that is created by these communities. And this creates a problem. If you look at Facebook, it's extreme, right? It's 100% of the value is captured by the platform, and 0% is paid back to the people who are actually creating that value. So this is a really, um, and we, can, we can see this in, the, in everything. T think about crowdsourcing, right? Crowdsourcing, you know, it makes a lot of sense, right? You have a, an issue, you broadcast the, the problem, and then workers all over the world can say, I can do this, right? This is, this is what it's about. And this is technically maybe a good thing, right? Because you have a problem, and somewhere out there, there is a solution, and the solution can adhere to the problem, right? But under conditions of commercial exploitation, what happens with crowdsourcing? Well, if you look at how these, they are designed, you have the demand. I, and I, I actually saw this quote in a book about crowdsourcing. This is so, uh, you know, a small entrepreneur. She needs a logo. She goes to 99designs. 
she says, I'm willing to pay $250 for a logo for my company. And then 120 people say, I can do it. And they start doing the design. And then she chooses one. And she says, isn't that great? Well, yes, it's great for her. Right? <laughs> but it's not great for the 99 people who are competing for those $250. And only one of them gets the job. So there is a study, it's not published yet, but it's by Trevor Schultz, who says that um, the average wage in some of these crowdsourcing uh, platforms is $2 an hour, right? which is way below the minimum wage. So this is, I mean, so peer production at the same time has this huge promise of you know, liberating work and, and creating communities and creating commons, shared resources and mutualizing resources, but at the same time, it clearly creates a problem. It's a, it creates an intensif intensification of the neoliberal uh, exploitation. Right? The feedback loop between the value creation and the capture value is broken. And as I said yesterday, this is not just a problem for precarious people. It's also a problem for people who need to sell things. Because if you pay less and less people to create value, you obviously have, an, you know, have a problem of realizing uh, your capital. right? So this is, a, this is what we call the value crisis. So if you th think about politics, how could we, uh, how could we do something about this? Uh, and this is uh, what I'm trying to describe here and uh, you know, what we are working on at the P2P Foundation. Um, so how, how could we envisage a system in which peer production could become socially uh, could be able to socially reproduce itself and create livelihoods for the people who create the value. Um, so as I said, we have three institutions. The community, which works through self-allocation of effort. Uh, I call it stigmerge yesterday, the signaling language of the ants. Think of Wikipedia as an enormously globally scaled signaling language where everybody can see what needs to be done, right? There's no command. In, in this. There's a control hierarchy, there's no command hierarchy. Nobody needs to say anymore what you need to do, right? It's an open and transparent signaling system which allows people to self-allocate, to socially allocate their resources. It's not a market mechanism, it's not a democratic allocation mechanism, it's not a hierarchical allocation mechanism. It's a, it's a social coordination mechanism, right? So, to summarize, uh, say so you could say, what pricing is to the market, and hierarchy is to planning. You could have democratic planning. What decision making is to planning. The commons, mutual coordination is to the commons, right? Mutual coordination is the allocation mechanism of the commons. Um, the second institution we described yesterday, we call it the entrepreneurial coalition, which is all the companies that are created to create scarce value around the abundant commons, right? Think about Linux. You'd be really stupid if you want to buy Linux because you can download it for free on the internet, right? So why do people pay for Linux? Well, they pay because um, installation, maintenance, labor, like you want to improve it, uh, education, certification, training. You know, there's a lot of services that need to to exist in order to make Linux work, even in, though itself it's an abundant resource. And because it's abundant, it's outside the market, right? If you want a market, you need tension between supply and demand. We don't have it when there is abundance. The, the third institution I described yesterday was called the, the, the Four Benefit Association. So we see in peer production the existence of new type of institutions. Uh, the FLOSS Foundation, Free Libre Open Software Foundations, uh, Linux Foundation, Wikimedia Foundation, GNOME Foundation, Drupal Foundation, Bitcoin Foundation. So what do they do? They're not classic NGOs. A classic NGO thinks in terms of scarce, there's a problem. We need resources to solve that problem. So we are going to organize and direct the resources to solve the problem. This is different. This is, there is a problem. There is enough people in the world with skills and a willingness to solve the problem. So we'll create and maintain a platform which allows people to allocate their efforts to solve this problem, right? 
So what these for benefit associations do is to create to maintain the infrastructure of cooperation, right? Well, if you think about the Wikipedia, millions of people, you know, go to these servers every day. You need money for the servers. Well, how do you get it? You can't sell the Wikipedia information. It's abundant and free. So in the case of Wikipedia, they do fundraising, basically, right? They, they, they maintain a system of fundraising so that the servers can continue to operate. So this is more or less what these foundations do. What I also said yesterday is that you could see this on a macro scale, right? We can start imagining a society that functions that way, right? If, if peer production, which is now in an emergent phase, would become a, a more dominant mode of value creation, then you would have potentially this, right? Now, the other vision I just showed, right, which I think is a negative vision because it's based on hyper-exploitation and doesn't create livelihoods. This is a macro system where you would say, in the, under these conditions, you could actually create livelihoods for the people who contribute to the commons. So, so the difference is that civil society has become a productive uh, civil society, right? In, in, under capitalism, we don't see it that way. We see private labor or capital creating value privately, right, as private persons then because market players only look at themselves, they don't look at externalities, then we need the state. Some say we don't need it, but uh, I would argue we do need the state to regulate what the market doesn't do by itself, right? So the limits of the market transactions are set by the state. Um, so here we, we have a productive society where citizens contribute to the commons. The Economy would need to be changed, right? Instead of extractive capital, we would need generative capital. Right? What's the difference? Look at the word entrepreneur. What does it mean? Etymologically, it's very clear. It means taking in between, right? This is how people saw it in the beginning. I, I live in Thailand, right? And my wife talks about the eaters. And who are the eaters? It's the, the, the people who rule are called the eaters, right? They eat our food. So entrepreneurs, etymologically, <laughs> you know, the word comes from how these people were seen at the beginning as taking in between, right? Um, so I advocate, it doesn't work, we advocate the word entre donors, right? Giving in between. We'll see if that works later on. But anyway, so, but here's the idea. So what we need is market entities which co-create commons, right? So I talk about open cooperatives. And one of our projects is called an Open Cooperative Development Agency, which we will launch in, in September uh, in Berlin. And the whole idea is to create this whole infrastructure that we need so that the people who create the value can create their market entities, make a living, and the value stays within that sphere, right? So you have a common sphere where you have accumulation of the commons, and you have a cooperative sphere where you have cooperative accumulation. Uh, we're working, for example, on a license called the Copy Fair license, which basically says the following: um, If you, if you're a common good institution, you can use our commons. If you are a non-commercial, you can use our commons. If you're for profit and you contribute to the commons, you can contribute to the commons. But if you're for profit, using our commons without contributing, you need to pay for the license, for the license fee. But it's not really about the money, it's about reintroducing the notion of reciprocity in the marketplace, right? So you, in this scenario, the Floss Foundation, right, the appropriate foundation which unites the commoners and, and the market entities that, that play within the commons, they would decide on what contribution means, what, what reciprocity means, right? So we're reintroducing the moral economy, right? Which is, as you know, so what, what Smith wanted to destroy was the moral economy of the Middle Ages, right? There were no free pricing in the Middle Ages. I don't know if you know this, but in many cities, if you, have, if you want to make a deal, there was always a third person. It was a third per person which decided on the price, right? It was not a power play in between demand and supply. There was a third person saying, this is the right price. So the just price theory of the Middle Ages, right? Uh, or it would be the city officials in the cities that would, where they would buy the grain. 
and there would be a fixed price until 5 o'clock in the afternoon. In some Italian cities they had hooded people, which had a right over life and death. So if any merchant would ask too much for the grain, they, they would have the right to execute them, right? Uh, this is a moral economy. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, so the whole idea of a moral economy is a, it's, an, it's a market form which in, internal, internalizes the externalities, right? So you, so that's the whole idea. So we want to do that through a license, through social charges, different things. Um, the copy fair license actually allows for corporations to, to collaborate, right? So you leave an opening. So think about IBM and Linux. IBM is accepted by the Linux community because it plays by the rules of the Linux community, right? So it actually does contribute to the Linux Commons. There is another license called the Copy, Sol Copy Solidarity, uh, um, from the Solidarity Company, which is totally against any for-profit company using their, their Commons. So Copy Fair is kind of a, an in-between thing. Okay, the third element, the Floss Foundation, if you see them on a macro scale, you would say, this is the Floss Foundation on a macro scale. It's a part of state, right? It maintains the infrastructural cooperation on the territorial scale, right? All the institutions that are needed for citizens to collaborate are maintained through this collective entity, which we call a partner state. Um, now you, so I want to show you now how we conceive this in Ecuador. By the way, there was very good news. I, I, I don't know if I sent it to you, uh, Eric, but uh, yesterday the Greek vice president said that they want to use they want to use the commons as a development policy in Greece. And they, th they want to do this in the whole of Southern Europe. So this is no longer as marginal as it was when I talked about this two years ago, right? So we have now serious players that are actually thinking that way. And it remains to be seen what they will do. But anyway, so at least it's in their stated intention. Uh, so this was done in Ecuador last year. And so what's the problem here? <coughs> Ecuador is a country with, without much industry, and it's purely based on extractive industries, right? Oil, mining, uh, agricultural products, and so they have low added value, so low margins, profit margins, even though the volume might be big. And then they have to buy consumer goods and industrial goods at high added value. So in other words, they're screwed, structurally screwed, right? Um, and so how, so the question was from three different institutions in Ecuador, uh, and you know, we were contracted to do this was, can we imagine a transition to a society that would be based on infinite resources rather than f finite resources? In other words, based on knowledge and specifically the, the concept of a social knowledge economy, right? So the idea is that knowledge rather than restricted to the people who control the intellectual property rights would be avail available for everyone, right? All citizens, all entrepreneurs, all public officials would have the right and the ability to use those commons and to improve them and make them available for the whole society, right? And to create around these commons a vibrant economy. Okay, so this was the, the basic idea. So this is how you have to imagine it. So imagine you have Education commons, a science commons, an industry commons, agricultural commons, and a civic commons with open data, etc. So we looked at three different things. The first was the feeding mechanisms, the enabling practices, right? If you want open science, a science commons, you need open access to scientific material. It doesn't exist anymore, right? I mean, you're privileged, you have your your university passwords. I'm not I'm not an academic. If I want to read Legally, a scientific article, I need to pay $30. I'm not going to pay it, so I don't have access to it, right? So this is the reality today. I think about, in Ecuador, a poor indigenous student that needs to pay every year 10 different textbooks at $70 a piece that only change 1 or 2% each year, if they change at all. Um, and is not going to rent it because it's even, you know, they have status issues, right? They are poor. So they already look down upon, so if they don't buy the new textbook, you know, it makes their situation socially 
not, not nice. So they, they buy it even though they can't afford it, so they go into debt, etc., etc. Um, so a feeding mechanism in this case would be open access, right? How do we have open access scientific publications in Ecuador, right? How, so for example, what you could imagine is, let's pay 15 professors to create an anthropology textbook that's always updated and that's always available online that you can print for five or ten dollars whenever you need it, right? So that would be an enormous difference for poor students if they would have access to this kind of uh, scientific material. So then we looked at uh, material infrastructures, right? So the whole idea here is um, you, you need physical infrastructure, right? Because this is one of the weaknesses of the, the cyberspace people is that you know, the internet is seen as something that floats, that shimmers, right? But it's we need pipes, we need uh, all kinds of stuff to make it to make it work. So the example with science was, uh, there's a book, an American book called uh, Open Source Lab from Joshua Pierce of the Michigan State Open Sustainability Lab, which shows how you can systematically transform, create a scientific lab with the same quality by replacing proprietary hardware with uh, open hardware. Right, open scientific hardware. For about 85, 90% of the machines, you can do this. So imagine, so if we do this, if we would do this in Ecuador, right, create the right material infrastructure, we can have science labs at 20% of the investment, which means we can have four or five times more students producing open science than we, if we don't have this, right? So this is a material infrastructure. Uh, then we looked here at immaterial infrastructures, and uh, this is just as important. I'll give you an example. In Ecuador, they have a very good free software regulation. So the, the public authorities actually have to use free software, and it doesn't work. So it's beautiful law. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, the state is obliged to hire people with a computer science diploma. There's not many of them. Ecuador only had 40 PhDs before the Korea government came into power in 2007. Imagine that, 40 PhDs for the whole country. Um, so for a computer science uh, graduate to accept a job at $1,500, when he can move to the US and get $4,000, you know, they're not there anymore. They're, they're gone, right? So the state, even though it has a good law, cannot hire the right people to actually carry out that law, right? So what can we do about this? Well, there are actually thousands of people in Ecuador who can code, right? They can code. They didn't learn it at university, but they can code because today learning can take place, you know, in peer networks, right? Coders, they, that's how they learn. They learn from each other. So what if we would have a system of open accreditation, right, of peer-to-peer -peer accreditation? open certification, right? And find a way for this open certification to be recognized by some academic institutions, right? So through these kind of immaterial decisions, we could solve that issue, right? It's not a material issue. The people are there. It's a legal issue, right? So we, you need legal. So anyway, so this is kind of the general idea that what we did there. And um, um, I, I cannot say the project was entirely successful, um, uh, but I'll give you one example of something that is working there. So this was a, um, it's a third poorest district in Ecuador called Sichos. It's in the volcano uh, area. 22,000 people, 20,000 of them are farmers, and 70% indigenous farmers. <coughs> And it's not going well for them because they don't have direct access to the market. So every year, the middleman pay them less and less because they say the Colombians are cheaper, right? Um, and they don't have machinery. So they live from a subsistence economy, which they have food, but they can't do anything else, right? They can't send their kids to school because they have no surplus. They can't pay their taxes because they have no surplus. Um, so here is one project that... Uh, actually had you know the agreement of uh, both the people there we, we spoke to the assembly of the people but also the mayor 
and the idea was open agricultural machining, right? So let's put, let's connect the indigenous farmers in Ecuador, in that region, with the open agricultural machine design communities. There are huge communities, one in the United States called FarmHack, has thousands upon thousands of free designs for agricultural machines. And they meet up all the time, they have workshops all the time in different regions of the US. Another project is called the Slow Tools Project, which makes uh, tools without energy that extend the human body and you know, so they don't have to have back hurts and stuff. So there's, there's a, a big community in France called Atelier Paysan. So these people exist, there's something called Nutrient Dense Project where people exchange seeds and, and, and study seeds worldwide and they create protocols online. Um, so the idea is to connect uh, the local people with these global open design communities and then connect them with micro factories and 3D printing machines that allow them to make those machines local, right? To create a domestic industry, if you like, uh, in sectors. Which brings me to a point where, as I said yesterday, we can have a new vision of the economy, right? Where we combine liberational knowledge and we have global open design communities. So knowledge becomes shareable and becomes accessible everywhere with relocalized manufacturing. Now, this brings me to a kind of a complicated argument. Um, so, think back about the 1960s. I'm 58, I was premature, I was 10 at that time in 68. Which, you know, many people see as a student movement, right? But historically, it wasn't just that. There were like 10 million workers on strike in France at the time, right? The goal left not because he was afraid of the students, but because of the general strike. Um, so what happened after these, you know, these radical movements was basically neoliberalism, right? So what, what, was, what is neoliberalism? It is young people, fine, you know, listen to your rock music. You don't have to say, you know, uh, you, don't have to, you can wear jeans at work. So we made a huge cultural compromise, right? At the same time, we deindustrialized, right? We made a conscious decision in the West to destroy the working class and manufacturing in the South where labor was cheap, right? So this is an issue for us because everything we have in the West comes from the labor movement, right? I mean, social security, the welfare state, everything we have comes from social struggles. It was never given, it was achieved uh, through all kinds of uh, social movements and then compromise, etc., etc. But in a situation where labor is structurally weakened, right, more and more, right? The, I don't know about the US, but I think it's 17% actually, right? Only 17% of the people in the US produce physical things, right? So the traditional working class is I think about 70% and it's going down. You look at the freelance economy, um, I heard different figures, but I've heard it's about, is it about one third in the US? Is that it? In, in Europe it's one quarter, but I think US is further ahead, if that is ahead. Uh, in creating these, you know, f freelance, independent, precarious uh, working conditions. So, in other words, politically, if we <coughs> if we depend on labor, we're dead. Right? This is the end of the welfare state. Um, what if we could reindustrialize? Right? If we could use peer production as a reindustrialization strategy, right? So, this, again, you may think this is totally token. The city of Barcelona has a new plan called Fab City 5.0. They want to relocalize industrial and agricultural production in and around the city by 2050. Right? 50 by 2050. This is the plan. In order to do this, they are building and financing 24 fab labs, each one per neighborhood, that have to serve as prototypes for this new mode of production. Right? So they will have a textile fab lab, a book industry fab lab, a, I don't know, all, you know industrial machinery uh, fab lab. Um, so the idea is to use the technology to create a new, a new paradigm for industrial production. If we would succeed in this, right, the surplus value, which is now no longer available in the West for social compromise, that surplus value would be recreated here, could also of course be used 
in the south and be you know used there as an industrialization strategy. Um, but essentially, this would recreate the surplus value would stay with the people again. You know what I showed before with the people who are creating that value, right? Um, so I think this is what the Greek vice president was saying yesterday when he said, you know, we will use commons-based development is to use the commons as a strategy uh, to rebuild the frayed economics of Southern Europe, uh, which are pretty much like Ecuador. There's not much industry. Uh, you know, it's, it's leaving. The industry is leaving Italy, Spain, and, and Greece. Um, so, yeah, so this is a, so the basic idea of a commons transition is you know, to create a society that's basically like this, right? Uh, no, here. Oops. Um, so to create all the conditions where, whereby people can freely contribute to the commons, can create livelihoods around it, and have the right c civic institutions and public institutions which allow this to happen, right? And of course, this is a progressive interpretation, right? And this is, a, I think, a big problem for the left, right? Uh, the capital is much more flexible, right? If you can make money, it's interesting, right? So if the commons, uh, Eben Moglen is the lawyer of the Free Software Foundation, said the commons is the wet dream of both communists and capitalists alike, right? Because technically, uh, the commons is you can freely contribute and then everybody can use, right? But it's also free, a lot of free labor, right? People are freely contributing, right? They're not paid. So capital is using peer production. They are massively investing in this, right? But there's also a political angle to this, and this is what we see happening in Northern Europe. The UK, the big society, and the Netherlands. It's called the Participation Society, right? So what does it mean? It's a conservative interpretation. It means the following. You don't need us, right? You're, you're active citizens. You can self-organize. So you don't need libraries. You don't need swimming pools. Uh, you don't need social insurance. You don't need health insurance. You can do it by yourself, right? So this is, this is a, a dangerous interpretation, an anti-social interpretation of the potential of peer production to destroy all the solidarity mechanisms that we have today, right? So I don't think this is what we want. We want something, and this is what the partner state is about, is to create right conditions, right? So, you know, just to explain how this works, like in Rotterdam, actually, I read an article about this, right? So you close the library. And in the UK, 30% of libraries are already closed, right? And 20% more will close in the next few years. So there will be at least half the libraries will disappear. So people can say, oh, let's save the library, right? Peer-to-peer, -peer, we connect, we, we crowdfund, and we have a nice library anyway. And then they close the swimming pool. Oh, OK, let's save the swimming pool. But how many times can you do this, right? If people are losing their livelihoods, are precarious, how many times can you, can you do this, right? Uh, so this is, a, this is a problem, right? This, if we have this interpretation of peer production, it is, uh, it's a problem, right? And this is not what, of course, what I'm arguing for. I'm arguing for a strong partner state. Now, let me give you some positive examples then. Uh, the, the most interesting project at the city level, I think, is called the Bologna Regulation for the Care and Improvement of the Urban Commons, right? This is, in my view, a very exemplary uh, uh, regulation. What it says is that citizens' coalitions can make proposals for the improvement of their neighborhood. It goes through some kind of qualification process, and then there is a negotiation between the city and the citizen coalitions about what do you need to do this, right? Um, so in this case, it's not the government doing it for you, right? It's the government enabling the citizens to do it by themselves. So this is, I think, a very positive example. They already uh, agreed to 30 projects in Bologna, 100 in the pipeline, and about 40 cities are taking this over in Italy. Right? So this is, uh, I think, a good example to show that the partner state is something real, it's something that can be done. 
not just an idea. Um, okay, so I, how can we organize for this? Uh, this is another question. I think I conclude with that actually, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a bit maybe still not happening, but I'd like to see it happen, right? Uh, okay, first bottom up. Here are my two two uh, proposals. Um, we need uh, assemblies of the commons, right? Local people, all the people who are creating and protecting commons as citizens should create local assemblies around this joint work, right? So this would create a forum in which to create commons politics, right? Because these communities would then put forward social charters and political proposals that could be taken up by, by the political world, right? So this is my first proposal, is to create these assembly, assemblies of the commons. Um, there's one that is going to be created in Ghent, in Belgium. Uh, I was there two weeks ago, so hopefully that will work. Uh, the second proposal is the Chamber of the Commons. So what's the difference? It's, you know, it's like church and state. You don't want to mix them, right? You have the citizens, but then you have all the companies working around the Commons and creating added value around the Commons, right? Today, the Chamber of Commerce doesn't support these alternative forms of value creation. Um, so, let's say you want to do a sharing economy initiative. You know, you're young, you're, you're technically savvy, you see a problem, and say, okay, I make a sharing platform so that people, demand supply, can meet each other. Well, what do you do? You do a startup, right? And if you do a startup, you have a red carpet. Everything is ready to help you with, with, with what you need to do. <coughs> if you want to do a co-op, it's very, very difficult. In most places of the world, it's very, very difficult. For example, in Ecuador, the law says you need 40 people to create a co-op. So if you're with five, you can't, you can't create a co-op. It's impossible, right? You can't create a startup, but you can't create a co-op, right? So a chamber of the commons would be the local body where all the solidar economy players, the social economy players, the cooperative economy players would come together again to discuss their joint needs, to, to, to formulate proposals, and to create supporting mechanisms, like incubators for this new economy, right? So we, we don't have that. I mean, there is an example mm -hmm. in Genève called the Chambre de l'Economie Sociale et Solidaire. So this is starting. This is a, a model which, which uh, I think we also need. So at the bottom up, this is what I propose. Uh, okay, my second proposal is top down, more or less. And I don't think it applies to the US, unfortunately but it, it's going to work in Europe. So here's the idea. I call it the grand coalition of the commons, right? So if it's true what I'm saying, that the, the, that the force of labor is diminishing, you can't create progressive politics around the notion of labor. So what do you do? Well, you can do it around the commons, right? Uh, and I've calculated that we have a democratic, demographic majority to do this, right? So think about the following. First of all, in many countries, including the US, we have new parties. Parties that are direct expressions of digital culture, of these early peer producing communities. We have the pirate parties. We have platform parties. These are parties like Partido Eke in, in Spain. There are a lot of them exist in Latin America that say, basically say, you know, they ask, they say, okay, we don't have a program, but the, the, we have a platform that, so that citizens can congregate and create their own program, and they, they participate in politics that way. They're not, they're not huge, but the pirate parties, at some point, and you know, they, may not, they may not maintain themselves, I'm not sure, because they're going down right now, but anyway, at some point, the Swedish pirate party had the majority of the voting <coughs> votes from young people 18 to 35. The majority, right? They had the most votes within that age range. So potential, the potential is there, right? Uh, so it's kind of knowledge working class, right? The, the, the cognitive working class and, and, and direct expression of, of their interest and culture. The second player would be the Greens. Now, again, in the US, this is not much. But in, in, in Europe, you know, the German Greens are big. 
10-15% of the vote, some, they're in the government in some states. So we have huge green movements, right? And it's very easy to see that the Greens you know, are, are naturally inclined around the, the, the idea of nature as a commons, right? So we have the digital commons, we have the nature commons. Then we have almost everywhere in Europe the creation of new transformative left parties, right? Social Democrats have become liberals, but we have these new parties like Syriza and Podemos, and they are really transformative parties. They're probably you know, like the left Social Democrats, maybe, right? Um, and we may agree or, them, or not, but they are, they are for the renewed industrial commons. Right? And it's no accident that the, the parties that are closest to the commons are actually Syriza and Podemos. Right? When you look at their history, Podemos comes straight from the Occupy, the, the 15M movement. Right? What was the 15M movement? It was the peer production of politics. Right? The, the way that Occupy worked and the way that 15M work is entirely in line with the functioning of peer production communities that, that produce uh, knowledge commons. Um, so think about Occupy. What is Occupy? O Occupy is a protocol, right? It doesn't say, you know, here is a membership and this is our program. What Occupy did was saying, you occupy the square, right? Protocol number one. You use mic check, protocol number two. You use general assemblies. Protocol number three. So there were a number of protocols. Everybody could say, I adhere to the protocol, and then I can say, I am Occupy or I am 15M, right? Now, politically, there were defeats, right? They, and uh, if you look at Spain and Greece, it's very clear. So they had 15 million people on the streets in 2011. And all these people hated politics. You couldn't show yourself with a label, you know, with a party or union, you were not welcome. And they stayed home. And then they had the most right-wing government in the history of the last 50 years, which has been devastating, you know, the social structures in Spain, more than 50% unemployment amongst young people, right? Uh, this, this same generation is now politicizing it, right? Because they made a mistake. They became anti-political and they see the result. And now Podemos is, you know, is, is the expression of that shift within that generation. A repolitization of the generation. Syriza is very similar. Syriza, we had Syntagma Square. A million people on the square in Athens. Didn't work. And then you have a repolitization and Syriza you know, grew from 2% to 30%. Podemos went from 0 to 8% and they now are 27%. So the situation in, in Europe is that we, we will probably have in Southern Europe transformative progressive governments in Spain and, and Greece, and maybe in Italy and maybe in Ireland, right? So something is moving there a bit like Latin America 10 years ago, right? So this kind of uh, energy is now happening, in, especially in Southern Europe. Uh, then we have social liberal parties, which I think are also interesting. There is, for example, in Denmark, something called Alternative. It's a social, ecological, liberal party. So they represent social entrepreneurs. You know, young people want to do good stuff, but they they have an entrepreneurial spirit, right? But they're progressive in their in many of their. their. So if we do this in Europe, I think we can have majority. So I'm not saying it's ready now, but using the Commons as a new glue. You know, to, to, to create an identity for a commonality between progressive politics, I think, is a workable proposition. Um, so, you know, I don't want to claim any, you know, uh, uh, power in this, but uh, we did, we did uh, workshops with Syriza twice, right? And the people who, who were in these workshops are not the people who are in the government. So something is, you know, something around the Commons transition is actually really happening <coughs> in Greece. They are thinking in a different way, not, not a status, purely status way about politics. Because this is, of course, the problems with the left, right? Privatize, re-regulate. Privatize, re-nationalize. So this, this whole idea that left means statism, and right? So, so the idea that we can have a commons view, the progressive commons view, as opposed to only a status view. And the difference is that you see the state as an enabling mechanism, right? How do you increase social and individual autonomy? How do you create the right infrastructure that people themselves can take initiatives? 
and basically can become, I would call it, civic entrepreneurs. Right? I consider myself a civic entrepreneur. I used to be a capitalist entrepreneur. I'm, I, I consider myself a civic entrepreneur. I'm poor, but I'm happy. <laughs> um, okay. It's okay. about time to conclude, right? We can have a conversation. Let's begin. Yeah. Anyone who would like to? Yes. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm lost, really. It's a, it's a beautiful bun, but where's the beef? Uh, I see the, the, the con contributor commons the civil society is producing for free. The ethical uh, economy is also not charging anything for their product. And the state is just regulating. So where, where is the money? How, how is, how, how is uh, yeah, well, the money is here, right? Yeah. The so, intersection is there? No, the money is here. Uh, so what, what's the problem with the commons, right? So you have free software. Uh -huh. Uh, free, it mean, doesn't mean free gratis, it actually means free to contribute. But anyway, the, the reality is, once you have a shared resource, that's, that's a knowledge resource. Uh -huh. Today you can copy it for free. Yes. Right? So it's not a market. You can't make money there. Right. right? So IBM today is basically a Linux consulting company, right? It used to be a hardware company. Uh -huh. Today <coughs> IBM makes many billions of dollars by being a Linux consulting company. They have adopted Linux as their basic infrastructure, but how do they make money? By, uh, by maintaining the infrastructure, by installing infrastructure, by integrating infrastructure, mm -hmm. by creating strategies, by consulting, uh, by certification mechanisms, by uh, ensuring the software. Mm -hmm. So around the commons, you do have all kinds of economic activities which are not scarce, right? Mm -hmm. I'll give you my example. I do everything for free on my wiki, mm -hmm. but my good friend here, Eric, pays me to be here, right? <laughs> so, you, you, so why? Because I'm scarce, uh -huh. right? I'm here physically, and if you want me, you have to pay me, I come immediately. Right, right? Right. But everything else I do for free, right? I, I don't charge anybody <coughs> anything for the knowledge that we are constructing as a community. It's free for all, everybody can use. But so there is an economy around the commons. And actually, I would argue it can be a bigger economy than a private economy. I'll give you an example. This is what happened in Europe versus the United States. So Europe is social democratic broadly, right? But here's what they do. So the state in every country produces geographical information. And here's what they think. Since we pay for it, we're not going to give it away. So we, we have an auction every year or every so many years and so we license two or three companies that produce geographic services. Mm -hmm. It's a very small economy. It's a monopolistic and very small economy. Here in, US, in the US, a very capitalistic US, the NOAA gave away geographic information, right? They actually made it into a public resource in a way in a commons, right? You combine the NOAA with the Google Maps and stuff like that. And so in the U.S. you have 400,000 people working and making a living by producing geolocation services, which we don't have in Europe. So because you, do the, because you chose a commons way, you actually have a bigger economy than a private, than if you had chosen a purely private way, right? So, so the whole idea is that you know, people who don't have access to the, the mainstream economy can create their own. Things. They can create, um, you know, micro factories, and the way to compete with big multinationals is by, is by sharing your knowledge, right? Because what is a multinational? It's it's a huge network that shares <coughs> privately, right? Mm -hmm. If we if we as citizens can create our own economy by sharing this information, we actually become more productive than the capitalist pr proprietary form. Um, but the whole idea, and this is my argument, is who gets the money, right? Mm -hmm. So today the money still goes by people who, who through private enterprise, totally capture that, that value and don't give it back to the commons, right? Mm -hmm. So we're working on, on basically a conversion between the commons economy and the solidarity economy, the social economy, the corporate economy. I don't know if that makes a little bit more sense. Okay, no, no. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, so I wonder if you could say yeah, a word. 
I have, I yeah. have a, a list. Eric, yeah, you, yeah, and I'll, just I'll, I'll monitor the <laughs> Matt first, then you, then you. And over there. Yeah. Yeah. Could yeah. you say another word about um, the role of the state? I see the expression partner state, but I'm wondering if a comprehensive alternative commons economy of the sort that we'd like to see requires active support from the state, or yeah. does it merely require neutrality on the state's point of view in terms of you know adjudicating between it and capitalism, or is it possible to achieve even if the state is in opposition to building a commons economy and determining? Well, both capital. happen, right? I mean, if you look at Spain. Right? In Catalonia especially, there is an enormous growth of this alternative economy, right? And it's entirely against the state because the state is a very right wing anti P2P, you know, they are against renewable energy, they're against co ops, they're against crowdfunding, and they make it very difficult. But the crisis is so deep in Spain that people just have to do it. They self organize and they, you know, there's a, a very rich. Uh, there's a very good book, if you have time, Aftermath by Manuel Castell, which shows what happened in, in Catalonia after 2008, and it's enormous. I mean, in terms of, you know, even objective numbers, the number of people engaged in alternative production is huge. Um, um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's impoverishing as well, right? So think about the labor movement, right? In the, in the, at the end of the 19th, end of the 18th century, you know, the final enclosures, millions of workers, you know, come to the cities and they have no, no, no insurance, no health care, nothing. So what do they do? They self-organize, right? They create mutual insurances, they create fraternities, they create unions, they create all these things. But at, just before the welfare state was organized in the West, which is, you know, like in the 30s, only 20%, 25% of, of the population had these services, right? So bottom-up is fine. It's not enough. If you want to scale, and that's what the welfare state did. The welfare state took over the models of the labor movement and scaled them at the national level. So personally, I think we still need you know, collective institutions that do that, that allow you to scale. Uh, because you have a lot of collective action problems. Think about, I was in Rio de Janeiro, and you have so 11 favelas. It takes 20 minutes to go down, 40 minutes to go up. Yeah, uh, and they're, they're like two hours away from the center of the city. So all these favelas were cut off from the mainstream urban economy. Now, if you think, let's have a transportation system, like which is what I did. They built a cable car system, right? And the cable car system connects all the, the, the hills of these favelas and connects them with two subway stations. The people who live at the bottom of the favela if you ask them, can you invest in a cable car that goes at the top of the favela, they say no. You know, well, we are, we're just there, we can take the bus. You see what I mean? So these collective action problems need collective institutions that can say, this is for everyone. So this is why you know, I believe in the role of the state. As the, the difference, is, I think, is in, in the idea of a welfare state as a kind of you know, top-down mechanism, right? Which is... We provide you with, and you're kind of a passive client and consumer, right? While the partner state has a vision of an active contributor, active, active citizens. So this is a change. So we don't have to do everything ourselves as a state. Like in, 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 in northern Italy, in Quebec, we have social solidarity cooperative for social care, right? So um, I don't know the politically correct works anymore, but anyway, so people who have mental and physical challenges, they put it that way, they, um, they were cut out of the healthcare system in the 80s. And the co-ops took over the system. And they are multi-stakeholder, common good institutions with a social goal of caring for these type of people. <coughs> multi-stakeholder governance, but finance with public money, right? So the state, the provincial government says, Everybody has a right for health care, but they don't have to do it as a bureaucratic system themselves. They can say, you know, we support the citizens who organize themselves to provide that care, right? So that's the partner state idea. Mm -hmm. Back there. So right now, for the great majority of people, the majority of earnings every month goes to food and shelter. Here in the, uh, yeah. How do you... Where does food and 
and shoulder fit in there because without those you don't have anything else and not for long. And how do you envision from the disaster condition we are right now, which resulted globally into a two-thirds preventable, but we are in an epidemic of obesity yeah. and type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular and so on and so forth. How do you see the transition uh, from the situation right now into the commons? with food and shelter. Okay, so let's take shelter, right? So the big issue with shelter is, is speculation, urban speculation. Uh, so you can create community land trusts that, that mutualize the purchasing of, of real estate and keep it out of the market. So there is a, this morning I was reading, it's a village in Spain called Mari, Marina Leda, where the city provides everybody with free housing. So anybody needs a house, the whole neighborhood mobilizes. The city buys, you know, like the stones or whatever. So the labor is, is given by your neighbors. The, the stones come from the, I mean, the bricks come from the city. And, and then for about like 20 euro per month, people have a house. On the condition that they will never sell it on the market. So if they want to leave it, it has to go to some, somebody else, right? In this city, it has 100%, 0% joblessness, and everybody earns 1,200 euro. And this is in a in a southern Spain, which is the poorest region of Spain. You know, so they they just took their their situation into their own hands, and they create these community land trusts and they create purchasing groups. Right? So it's happening in Greece as well. Is that people, you know, like. You know, because there's a real issue even buying food in Greece, they connect directly now with the, with the farmers, right? Now, this was very difficult to do 20 years ago because of coordination and transaction costs. But today, with the networks, you know, finding those farmers, uh, organizing yourself, knowing where you have to go to pick it up, it, it's, it's become so much more easier, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there is something in Greece called the potato movement, and 70% of the potatoes now come directly from the farmer to the consumer through this system. And it has a proven deflationary effect on the price of potatoes, right? Because all the, the, the middlemen who take away the value, in this case, you, can, you pay cheaper as a consumer and the farmer gets more. But you have this in the U.S., right? Yeah. Well, Madison, <clears throat> Madison has the highest concentration of community-supported agriculture in the country on a per capita <clears throat> So yeah, this well, it's a very expensive adventure. You have to pay it? monthly, and uh, you get what they send you, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. There are some negatives, like you know, you get a package. Uh, like the spinach yeah. you had last night was was a CSA yeah. spinach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, is that construction the those buildings for the homeless similar to what he's talking about here in Madison? No, that's the, the, the very little houses. That yes. That no, that's. I don't know the device by which that's done, but it's, I don't think it's the same. Yeah. Uh, there was a hand back there, and then... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, the libraries disappearing in, in Britain, uh, and I, I don't see that happening here. I, you know, like, at least in, in the Madison libraries, um, there are computers everywhere. So, people, so it's a place where you can have a free computer. So there is a commons element there, it also the, the librarians can network you, can, can help you find things on the computer. So they, they moved into the internet age and, and in the downtown <coughs> library in Madison uh, you can make a video or, 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 or things like that. Uh, you can produce your own materials and, and, or they'll lead you through the steps of uh, publishing your own book. Uh, well, that, that for me is like a partner state approach. Yeah, right? partnership. Yeah. They're, 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 they're partnering. And I'm wondering, uh, is, is this not happening in Europe or not happening in Britain? Uh, uh, what, the, the libraries are going well, away because it seems like yeah, the libraries have, here yeah. have found a way to adopt. The, the, I think the problem is we, we now have a, a right wing, right, yeah. in Europe, and I think in the U.S. as well, which believes that people don't need culture. It's all about business, and if it doesn't directly generate business, then it's something that's a waste of money, right? So this is the, basically the policy of the UK government. 
It's an anti, really an anti-cultural policy. They cut subsidies for everything which, you know, STEM, what is it, science, technology, engineering, and math, math right? So everything which is not STEM has been cut from the UK education budget. So if you want a, you know, a literary or humanities, you have to pay for it yourself. And tuition rates go up. So we have these governments which are profoundly anti-cultural in our view. They think, you know, if you need it, you'll pay for it. And of course, it's the crap for the common people. And, you know, rich people go to the opera and they will finance it themselves. That's the whole idea. Uh, I don't think you have it here yet, but the, in the Netherlands, the cultural budget was cut by 70%. 70%. The national cultural budget. Libraries have a special status in the U.S. Ironically, they were founded by Andrew Carnegie, who yeah. set up all these... I was a librarian, by the way, and I, I was working for the United States Information Agency for nine years. Oh, boy. As a reference library. It's not to not to be confused with the CIA, right? right. Emmanuel. So USIA is the is the giver, it's yeah, not the same. taker. Yeah. <laughs> Emmanuel and then Tom. So, hi. so it, it seems to me that really the one critical factor or condition for like the expansion, the emergence and the expansion of like the PCP logic are physical network technologies, and yeah. also electronic network technologies. So could you just comment on you know them be, could you comment on, on, you know, the fact that they are mainly in like private hands, like at least yeah. physical infrastructures, that like a capitalist state basically is pretty much in full control over those um, structures? Yeah. And could you just comment, you know, on, in what sense is that like well, status it's, of you control know, so, so really like a bottleneck and like yeah. a, a big barrier to really the expansion? Because you could imagine that at a point in which like, the comments in the P2P logic start really to take over larger and larger parts of society, that you know, capitalist and private interests would start to really feel threatened yeah. and just shut everything down. I mean, well, um, so you know, here's the way I formulate it, right? Markets are scarcity allocation mechanism, right? You, but capitalism has become a scarcity engineering mechanism, right? Think about Monsanto, you know, Terminator seeds, right? So we are in a phase now where things that are naturally abundant are made on purpose scarce so, so that the market can, 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 and this is happening with broadband, right? The US is one of the worst countries in the Western world for broadband. Why is that? I used to work, I was a strategist for a big telco, right? I've made many things, this is one of them. So here's the logic, you know, we have these fiber optic cables in Belgium one around every big city. The, the, the highways have them and the railways have them. We don't use them. They are used like 0.0005%. You know why? It would destroy the market, right? So if you leave broadband in private, in private hands, they will never do it, which is why the US has a very, very bad broadband situation. But there are some cities in the US, I don't know which ones, that have municipal broadband, right? And now the what's the Koch brothers are fighting against this, right? In those cities, they have very good broadband. In Ecuador, you know, we discovered that the official government company had plenty of fiber, and they just don't want to share it. Well, you know, really, Ecuador needs broadband, and especially you know, indigenous communities and isolated communities, and they're not sharing it. It's there. It's it's not a technical problem. It's it's a logical problem, right? <coughs> so one of my arguments is also about sustainability, right? So Wikispeed, I mentioned that yesterday. Wikispeed is a car that was designed by 80 people in 12 countries in three months, but it's five times as fuel efficient as any industrial car you can find in the market. And why is that? Because if you design in an open design community. You don't design for scarcity. You don't design for planned obsolescence. You just want to make the best possible car. If you combine that with an ethical economy, so you actually have a company that produces and sells the cars, it sells sustainable cars. Because it, doesn't, it hasn't designed those cars itself you know, to maintain artificial scarcity. Right? It has been designed by the community. And you just make and sell it. 
So I think this is a much more balanced uh, system that would have huge uh, sustainability benefits. There are 26 open source car parks that are all sustainable. And not because they are green. This is the point, right? These hackers are not green. They're not ecologists. They just want a car that drives and that drives well and that they can replace the parts themselves. And so this is a very good logic for innovation, technical innovation as well. Tom. Is it not true that Scott Walker's recent uh, intention is to turn the University of Wisconsin into a technical college mm -hmm. by revising the uh, Wisconsin idea and by cutting the budget? Yes, uh, it's very much representative of this kind of, uh, you know, barbarian. They're cultural barbarians. They really want to destroy anything that is not instrumental for profit. You know, that's fluff. They don't want the fluff. Um, and they think there are too many students, right? So, <laughs> Laura. Um, you may have talked about this yesterday, but could you just share a bit more about this cooperative center that you're setting up and how you see the, the role of cooperatives in the ethical economy? Okay, so here's the problem today, right? Is that the open production is capitalist and that the cooperative production is not open. So if you look at Mondragon, you know, the largest cooperative in the world with, I don't know, 80,000 workers, everything they do is patented, right? So they still operate within this paradigm of enclosing. And of course, it may be good for their own workers, but it doesn't produce benefits for anybody else. So the, what we want to create is open co-ops, co-ops that structurally and legally are obliged to co-create commons, right? We have four rules, uh, common good orientation, multi-stakeholder governance, common co-creation, and global orientation. Now, here is the problem. Wikispeed can produce cars that are five times the fuel efficient, but they don't find any money. Because a, a purely for-profit entrepreneur doesn't want to invest in something that doesn't have a patent. Right? So we have to create an alternative infrastructure of funding and technical assessment. You know, I call it open technology assessment. You used to have it, uh, Office of Technology Assessment in the US. So we need an Office of Open Technology Assessment. We need funding. And so the idea of an open cooperative development agency, which we're working with a, a group of cooperative people in the UK and Canada, and uh, people from the solidarity economy, from the RIPES, is to create an infrastructure that would provide funding and, and, and kind of you know infrastructural support for these new kind of entities, right? So that they can do things in a more easy way, right? If you have a car that's five times the fuel efficient, you know, in, in a world of climate change, why don't we why are we not producing it? You know, I mean, does that that doesn't make any sense, right? It's there. And it's it's getting it's and there's so many things that today you know, there's actually an American project somewhere in Seattle, and it's, you know, it's a, a glass house. It has solar energy, feeds the plants, the plant feed the fish, the excrement of the fish feed the plant. You know, I mean, we, ha we are, and this is all totally open source, right? Have you heard about it? Okay, good. But most people don't even know it exists. So these things are not scaling up as they should, because there is no infrastructure to, to help them scale, right? And the press is not talking about these things, right? There's no, you know, if, if, you, don't, if you don't want, to, if you don't look for it yourself, you will not see it. It's out there, but it's not visible if you not, don't look for it. Yeah. Yes. As we, um, as we approach the climate change, which is driven by the extractive <coughs> of fossil fuels and then the burning of those, do you feel like that phenomenon, once it's uh, realized, that this will be the alternative that will emerge as something that can cope with groups of people living within the confines that, well, they, that know, they're once, going to be forced to? Once we have $400 you know, per gallon oil, right? Globalization as we know it today doesn't make any sense. 
you know, we're not going to buy cars that are made in China if the oil is at that price. Already we saw it, there was a there was a mini peak oil, you know, like a few years ago, and immediately companies start coming back to Mexico, right? In, like in, in two years, there was already a shift from China to Mexico. Okay, now we're back in a, in a, but fundamentally, I mean, we are actually past peak oil already, and fracking is just like, you know, it gives us an extra 10 years, right? Um, so, yes, at that moment in time, you, we need these kind of solutions, right? We need to relocalize production, not 100%, you know, but substantial shifts to relocalize production. So the problem is, and you're probably familiar with the shock doctrine, right? So when there is a crisis, and if you're not ready, and the other side is ready, then it's going to get worse, right? Then you think about what happened after the Roman Empire. Five centuries, no roads, no ceramics, nothing, right? A total, a total collapse uh, of, of civilization. There are people who say it wasn't that bad because if you were a farmer, you know, actually you, you may have that better life. It, it's actually the ruling class that collapsed, basically, right? Uh, but, you know, we don't... So if, if we use that intelligently, right, local, relocalized production, which saves three quarters of production costs, right? There, there's a study about this, that if you look at material and energy flows, three quarters is transportation, not production, right? So you save all that. Then you put, you make cars locally, on demand. No surplus, no marketing, you know, just when you need it, right? Then you put it in a sharing economy context, mutualization, right? You can have the same amount of miles with 80% less matter and energy if you mutualize your cars. One car replaces 15 private cars, if you want cars, right? Uh, if you do a circular economy on top of that, so you have open materials, open supply chains, you know where everything goes, you can apply circular economy principle. So all this, you know, it's cumulative, right? It's not enough to do one thing, but if you start integrating them, then you can have, you know, protect dramatically the level of welfare we have with dramatically less matter and energy. So th that's the hope, right, that we can do this. And the more we do now preparing, the more we're ready when when the shit hits the fan, right? Uh, so we, we, it's the counter shock doctrine, right? We have to be ready now. The people who have an anticipatory consciousness have to start doing it now. Any final question today? Otherwise, we'll close now and continue this tomorrow at the open discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you.